This story begins years ago, longer than some of us in this room have been alive. The year I turned 20, I came home from college for Christmas and did what a lot of people in small Northern California towns do. I went to my brother's high school basketball game. On the way home, we stopped by one of those mini strip malls for pizza and bored with waiting, I went for a walk. And I ran smack into two strangers with stringy hair, skin beth baked like meth addicts. Hello, the taller one said. And both held my gaze as they went by. The next day, a missing persons alert went out for two UC Davis freshmen. Their last known act was to buy ice cream for a Christmas party at the Lucky's at that same mall that same evening. At first, people thought they might have eloped, gone to Tahoe. But two days later, they were found dead, throats cut. The Davis police asked anyone who had been at that mall that evening to call. When the police came to take our statements, they seemed bored, more interested in the Dalmatian in the yard and my parents' historic Victorian home. But the detective who came a few days later was different. By then, more details had hit the news. The couple had been duct taped, their throats viciously sliced, like a scene out of Truman Capote's In Cold Blood. The case made the front pages up and down the wet coast. The female detective looked at me straight in the eye and said, you know, this could have been you had you been with your brother instead of by yourself. And then she sat me down to look at a binder of photos. I picked out several people. She showed me more pictures. Again, I picked out people. The same people who looked me over and pointedly said hello, the ones who didn't seem to fit in. And that is how I, a cold winter field, and a murder collided. I went back to college, back to books, tests I might or might not pass, to what to do with myself when I graduated. I tried to forget the murder, but those two floated in my subconscious like seaweed, and I could feel them looking over my shoulder like shadows. I lived illegally in France for two years, writing film reviews. Back in the States, I worked in news, got married, went to Texas. I made documentaries and developed a weird obsession with crime shows. For a little while, I forgot. The case became known as the Davis Sweetheart Murders. In a place where the murder rate had been at zero for years, the case lurked under the city's skin like a virus. One of the dead teenagers had been a local boy, a friend to many, including my younger brother. Davis had lost its innocence, and people needed answers. Nine years later, the police suddenly called. Come to the station. The detectives need to ask you something. This time, they had more mugshot books. Again, I picked out pictures of men I had seen the night two teenagers had died and I had been spared. Are you sure? Asked the detective. What I didn't tell him was that the encounter had become a video loop in my head, replaying every time I thought of those two dead kids, the two men who had watched me so intently, men, the Yolo County DA would tell me, who might be interested in doing a copycat murder to cast doubt on the recent incarnation of their half-brother, a psychopath and sex slave serial killer who enjoyed abducting and killing young couples in nearby Sacramento, using his then-girlfriend as bait. Any pair of college-age kids would do. There, but for the grace of God, later, less than a year, I was brought in to do a lineup. By then, the suspects had been in jail for several years on other charges. It's hard to see the former addict under the clean inmate. I chose the wrong person. Oh, well, for the detective, you tried. That's all we can ask. He sounded disappointed, and I, I was stunned and a bit relieved because I had done my part. To my surprise, the DA called me anyway to testify on behalf of the boy who had had his throat cut and the girl who had begged for both their lives. I sat in the courthouse for three days. I was ordered not to leave town. I testified for two whole days. The first day, I went willingly. I don't really remember seeing the defendants. I was too scared to look in their direction. How on earth? asked the defense attorney, could you possibly have chosen the same people's photos every time you were shown a mugshot book? He smirked at the judge. I don't know, I said, I just did. And I did it again, right there in the courtroom, choosing photos from an exhibit of mugshots. The defense suggested the DA had coached me. I denied it three times. The de defense declared me a hostile witness. No kidding. 
They had to subpoena me to make me come the second day. Rachel, the defense said, you must have such an empty life to be so fixated on a little group of pictures. You think you saw something, but you didn't. It's Rebecca, and I know what I saw. 12 years after two 18-year-olds turned up dead in a foggy field, I was living in Morocco, covering the Algerian Civil War for US newspapers. Because the trial had moved to the next phase, I had to register with the US Embassy because I would be subpoenaed again. Every time the phone rang, I was sure it would be the Embassy telling me it was time to go. When the call finally came, I filed my latest story and left. In court, I refused to give my address for the record. We have the right to know, the defense said, his arm sweeping towards the defendant's table. No, you don't, said the judge. Move on. Once again, I had to describe a cold evening in December, point to photos, describe what I saw, and point to the defendants who were watching me closely, just as they had that night. The case faltered, the charges were dropped. A year later, one of the defendants sued me for conspiring to deprive him of his civil rights. I called the Yolo County Witness Assistance Program begging for help. Good luck, said the assistant DA and hung up. In a closed session between lawyers, the suit was dropped and I was forbidden to write about any of this for 10 years. My parents would get phone calls from locals asking, how's Rebecca? What is she doing now? Has she said anything about the case? My parents learned to be evasive. 14 years later, a friend of my brother's published Justice Waits, a book on the case in which I came off as uncooperative and slightly unhinged. In 2007, 48 Hours picked up the story and did a show. Thousands watched, but I was shaking so badly I had to turn it off. And after that, I stopped answering the phone. By then, I was living in San Diego where I got my MA and worked in local news. And one day, an article on the net suddenly caught my eye. The very same defendant who had tried to sue me had skipped parole and fled to Mexico. He was believed to be heading back through the Tijuana crossing. By now, he had an impressive rap sheet of dangerous and violent activities like armed assault and homicide. 20 minutes away from me, whom, if you, can know, if you know how to use the internet, you can find me in less than half an hour. I couldn't breathe. Freaked out, I called my parents. They called the DA, who said, oh, he's not really that kind of person. <laughs> I only put my tire iron back in the car after they caught him in Calexico. After that, things were kind of quiet, and then I got a phone call. And the phone call went like this, hello. You need to come to Sacramento to testify for a few days. We don't know quite exactly which ones, but it's next week. Make me, I said. <laughs> You'll be arrested. So I have a life and a job. No commitment, no dice. Set the date, tell them that. When I had to cancel a class I taught at Palomar College, the department secretary gave me a hug. Thank you, she said. For what? For testifying. And she told the story of a beloved brother who had been murdered, of a DA who couldn't be bothered to do a trial, of parents who had died early. For you to do this means a lot to people like me, she said. I think of how the girl had been assaulted, how their bodies had been left in a ditch, 12 feet apart. Suddenly, I'm 20 again, listening to the news reports, the detritus of Christmas littering the living room. It is the last Christmas. I will be just me. I cannot not go. Before we go to the courthouse, my mother tells me what the DA told her. Had I been wandering the mini mall with my brother, we would have probably wound up in that ditch, hidden by fog so dense you could not see your own feet. I sit in the lunchroom of the courthouse in Sacramento talking to the family lawyer. I tell him about the detective, the photos, the lineup, the subpoenas, the lawsuit. I am trying not to get hysterical. Again, I wait on a bench. 
all day. Day two, and there are several witnesses for this murder trial sitting in the hallway, a man waiting outside a nearby courtroom crumples and hits the floor. What happened? asked the woman next to me. The woman across from us starts to explain and then stops. I saw nothing, she says. I saw what you saw and that's it. We all look at each other. More than 25 years of this, says the woman next to me. Next time, I see nothing. Everyone nods and looks at the floor. There will be no next time. This has to be enough. And then the bailiff calls me in. I'm a neutral witness, questioned by both attorneys. The defendant looks like a red-haired ZZ top in a suit. I finish telling, again, what I saw. I leave the courtroom, and the mother of the dead boy follows after. She has been at every hearing, every trial for more than 25 years. Thank you, she says quietly. Thank you for coming. I don't know what to say. This could have been my trial, and this woman, my mother. A few weeks ago, I learned the trial was over. The verdict read, this month, Richard Hurstfield starts his sentence on death row for the murder with special circumstances of John Riggins, that boy, of Davis, and that girl, Sabrina Gonzalez, of Hawaii, and me, my sentence is over. Rebecca Romani.